Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. I uh, appreciate you joining this uh, session. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a, a proposal we're making to extend the Operation Smart Contract for Hyperledger Fabric to support uh, consortium governance. Um, so this is a, a proposal for work activity to be done, uh, something that we're at Oracle definitely interested in because we see consortia formation and governance as being a, a major issue when it comes to blockchains. So what I want to cover today is a little bit of a, just a really brief intro about what is, what is a consortia, a little bit about the what the Operation Smart Contract uh, Hyperledger Labs project is all about, and then some information about gov consortia governance, some voting enhancements we'd like to see, and as well then a summary. So I, I, whenever I present, whenever I talk to customers, whenever I talk to other technical folks, I, I like to refer to blockchain as a team sport. Um, there are certainly a lot of blockchain networks out there that have been created that are managed by a single organization, but then you lose much of the capabilities and much of the advantages of having a decentralized environment. So a consortium basically is just an association of businesses. So it's one or more businesses that want to get together and be able to conduct business together for some mutual benefit. Um, that consortium has been around for a long time. Uh, that's nothing new. Uh, so what we're looking at is how do we solve some of the issues associated with forming a consortium? There's a number of them that are business related issues. What are the, the, the laws that you'll adhere to, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but there's also a bunch of technical issues, especially when it comes to blockchain. So when you create a blockchain instance, and you create a network, you need to have members join that network. You need mechanisms to be able to include those in the network. Um, and so all that has to be a bunch of technical issues, such as you know, uh, exchanging things like uh, MSP information and that sort of stuff. Um, and the, the, the need is for multiple organizations to work together without one being sort of in control of the Uber organization. Uh, a lot of blockchains have that right now where there's one organization that essentially formed the network and it's roughly in control. What we'd like to propose is something that's a bit more decentralized than that. Um, and as well, we've just, uh, we, we, we think that decisions and any actions that take place in the blockchain network need to be auditable. So they've got to be recorded in the on a ledger someplace where they can be verified and people know what's actually being, uh, has been decided and what, was, what actions were taken. Um, and ideally what we want to do is sort of automate as much of this as possible, especially this technical side of things. <clears throat> so a little bit of introduction to the Operation Smart Contract or OPSSC. Um, this is a Hyperledger Labs project that was contributed by Hitachi. Um, there was a session on this or a demo of this on, on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, and what it consists of is, is several several different components. So the, the first two major components are, are there's two smart contracts. One smart contract is used to maintain the chain code life cycle or manage the chain, so, chain code life cycle. And another one to manage channel management. So adding members to the channel, that, that sort of, those sort of operations. And, and largely, this is all around workflow. So it's trying to automate and, and simplify these operations, which are right, right now are largely manually done and have to be you know, done by each organization that's, that, that's participating. Um, so what these, these smart contracts do is, is they manage the state transition. So you know, from a proposing of a chain code deployment to or proposing a new member to a channel or changing the channel configuration, those are all done as proposals and voted on. And the, the smart contract is what sort of manages the life cycle of those proposals and changes. There's also an agent. So this is the ops smart contract uh, agent. And what it does is it automates the operations. So when an agreement is made to, we'll say, deploy an, an up, or to upgrade a new chain code, um, the agent gets notification that when sufficient members have uh, agreed to this, and so they meet the, uh, the policy associated with updating or deploying a new chain code, and then what the agent does is it automates that for each individual organization. So that's an optional thing. You don't have to use that, but the agent then definitely takes care of, of, of automating much of the operations. And then there's also an API server. So the API server is what manages sort of the state of the workflow. So it provides a set of REST APIs to be able to access the, those chain codes, the, 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 the chain code for lifecycle chain code and the channel management chain code. Um, and what it does is it basically accepts things like proposals to do some of these operations. And then it also accepts votes from the various um, members. Uh, and again, it runs as a separate server in each organization's instance or somewhere within their organization. Um, and again, I want to focus to say that this is focused largely on automation, not on enforcement. 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit about enforcement because some of that will require some changes to the way Fabric manages the uh, uh, decision-making process and, and agreements. So for chain code operations in the current uh, ops SC is that an organization proposes a new or upgraded chain code by it calls its API server. So it makes a request to the API server. The API server in turn then invokes the chain code up the channel channel or the uh, uh, smart contract chain code to record the proposal. Um, once that proposal is recorded, the operation system chain code chain code emits uh, an event, and that event is listened to by all the organizations that are part of the consortium and uh, then operates on those events. So in the case of, let's say it was a proposal to, you know, to update a chain code, uh, as each organization then uh, votes for that, uh, that information is also done by invoking their API server, which, which records the vote using the OPSC chain code. Um, and as well, then the OPSI system chain code e uh, emits an event for each of those, uh, such that once enough votes have been uh, achieved to be able to meet the, the policy associated with upgrading or deploying new chain code, that those operations can proceed automatically. So let's say once the vote passes, the uh, organization one agent will download, install, and approves and commits the chain code. And the other two agents in, say, in the three organization network would download, install, and approve the chain code as well. And then this takes this happens automatically, but based upon once the, the necessary criteria of voting has been met. Uh, channel operations operate in a similar fashion. So uh, when organization uh, proposes a config update in a machine in a human readable format, which is important. Um, and it does that by then calling its API server with this human readable update proposal. The, the API server then invokes this, the, the channel chain code to record the proposal. Uh, it converts that proposal into a, a, a configuration transaction. Um, and then it also emits an event so that all the other organizations that are associated with the, the smart contract can re receive the notification that a pr proposal has been made. The or other organizations then get to vote on the proposal by calling their API servers. Uh, and once the, the API servers have recorded the vote, uh, and, and again, it emits an event just like they did for the chain code uh, deployment. Uh, and that again is received by all the organization's agents. Once sufficient votes have been uh, recorded, then one of the agents will take that converted configuration transaction and then I perform the channel update operation. So that'll include having all the various signatures that'll be, be part of what the voting operation is, is to record the signature of each organization as they approve the vote. So, so what's missing? So what's missing from our perspective is this notion of consortium governance. So who are the members of the consortium? Uh, what are they allowed to do? Uh, how, do, how do you add or remove or alter the, the what members can do? So all this issue about membership and what they're able to do and, and who's responsible for what. Um, so we think that's one major piece, and I'll get into more about what, we, what our proposal is to address this. Um, and as well, we believe that we need some voting enhancements. Um, right now, we just, it's all that the uh, OPC system chain code supports is a simple majority mechanism. What we want is to be able to support things like uh, non-uniform voting rights. Um, there are a lot of cases where some organizations may have more rights than others. There may be uh, a subset of the organizations that are sort of a governing console, if you will. But there's a lot of different various use cases for why you might want to have non-uniform voting rights. Um, and as well, we'd like to see support for abstaining and opposing. So right now, the, the, uh, all that's supported right now is basically to say, I approve. There's no ability to be, say that I oppose this particular request or particular vote, or a way to be able to say, I acknowledge it, but I'm not going to vote on it. I'm abstaining from voting on it. So what's needed then are some extensions then to the OPC system chain code to be able to support these governance operations. Uh, and again, I say this is largely focused on automation. Uh, supporting, uh, you know, the enforcement of it is something that will have to be done as well with not only within the chain code, but also inside of Fabric itself. And I'll get into some details of what kinds of enhancements we need to be able to support that in a minute. Um, so what we're trying to do is, let's say, move from these, oftentimes these, what we call a founder-led consortium to a, a more decentralized governance. Um, 
and, and initially not going to change the enforcement policies within Fabric. Uh, ideally, we want to do that such that we can provide some of these things like potentially veto capabilities or, as I say, asymmetric voting capabilities. Um, that's not necessarily part of the initial proposal, but something that we believe ought to be done. Um, so as I say, there's nothing that we're, what we're proposing right now to prevent members from using standard Fabric capabilities. So it, you can create your own config TX uh, transaction. You can solicit the signatures necessary from the various organizations through some out of channel or uh, out of band mechanism. Um, and this isn't going to prevent that. Uh, something else is that we want to support, as I mentioned before, is that the, all members are not necessarily equal. So uh, in many cases, you, as I say, you'll have consortiums where for, for whatever reason, some members have more rights or different rights than others. And so we want to be able to support that kind of capability in the voting mechanisms and, and how it's determined as to what members can propose and do what. Um, so we want to support, you know, say non-voting members. So members who are basically, they don't get a say, they have to go along with whatever the agreements are that are made by the voting members. Um, and as well, you know, we, the proposals to be able to change who can do what, whose members are, um, those sorts of things are something that we also feel should should be supported. Um, and then again, as I mentioned earlier, that all these decisions and all these actions need to be recorded in the ledger, so they're auditable and it can be you know ensured that the the proper processes were followed. So one of the issues, one of the, probably the major issues in forming the course consortium, is is how do you exchange the information. Um, right now, there are no mechanisms to do that, uh, per se. So to form the consortium, everything's got to be done out of band, uh, meaning that it's not recorded in the ledger, There's, as there is no network yet, you're still forming the network. Um, and so what I, we're proposing is that this be done partially out of band. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. But it has to do with a bootstrapping issue. How do you, how do you put something in place that people can use to come to agreement um, before before everything is settled. Um, so, and then, you know, what information has to be exchanged? Uh, we believe in at least minimally for each um, member organization, we need the MSP information uh, so we can verify signatures and the like. Um, and we also will need uh, some information about the ordering service network that the, the participants will use. Um, and then finally, in terms of, you know, for the consortium members, what actions are they each allowed to perform? And so this is something that has to get decided up front uh, and a proposal made to be able to, to create this kind of a network. <clears throat> so what is being proposed is that when somebody proposes the formation of consortia or, you know, notice how do you bootstrap a consortia, there's going to be a single member that at least, or in theory, a member, that's what we're calling the proposer. And so the proposer is the one that would create the ordering service and their initial ordering service nodes. It would create the ops channel. So the, this is the channel over which the various uh, consortia actions would be recorded and voted on. Deploys the two chain codes as I mentioned, actually the three chain codes now because we're proposing adding an additional one. There's the chain code ops, there's the channel ops, and then there'd be a consortia ops chain code that would be deployed as well for managing these consortium operations. Um, and then finally, the, the, the proposer starts its own agent and its own API server. And what we're proposing to be able to solve this bootstrapping problem is that the proposer provide a, a temporary set of limited credentials to their API server. And what I mean by limited credentials is are credentials that can only be used to perform certain operations. And in this case here, it would only be able basically to be able to, pro to provide their information and accept the membership into the consortium. Um, so the proposal also then defines, you know, who, who the, the it, it, I'm sorry, <laughs> then the, the uh, proposer then commits this initial consortium proposal to the chain code uh, that's only now at the moment running in its own organization. And then the, somebody, either the proposer or the agent could potentially do this, emails the other notifications to give them the access to the API server, so it's URL and it's temporary credentials. Obviously, there's other mechanisms that can be used here to exchange that email, it's just the proposed mechanism. There are probably other more secure mechanisms that would be desirable, um, but this is at least the initial go. Um, and then, as the other organizations will, will get this information, they'll connect to the API server and they'll provide their MSP information. Uh, and then the agent then will then update the ops channel with their information and have them join that channel. 
<clears throat> finally, the other organizations, they say they'll use the, the, the initial members or the proposer's API server. They will uh, download the conversion perform uh, formation proposal uh, and use the information in there, such as the OSN information, the, the proposer's MSP information, that sort of stuff to configure a minimal instance in their network. Or in their in their environment, um, and then if they decide they're going to join the network, they would uh, as well provide their MSP info through the initial members API server. Um, so once all that's once that's been done, then the initial members agent can uh, add the MSP information to the the ops, ch ops channel and install then the ops chain code and start up a local ops agent API server. <laughs> what we're thinking in terms of what would be in this initial consortium formation proposal would be uh, some information about the consortium itself. So this would be things like the name, description, uh, a list of who the initial organizations are that are being proposed, uh, what the voting policy is for the consortium. So this is like what is the policy that it, and what that has to be met to be able to change the configuration of the consortium. Uh, and, and, and that's in terms like, you know, like voting policies and other information. Uh, but then we'd also have a, a membership voting policy. So what's it, what is it required by the existing members to be able to add or remove members? Um, so that may be, a, that's, we're envisioning that as potentially a separate policy. Um, and then for each organization, what's required then is we would need the name. We obviously want some contact information, things like email address of administrators or operators, um, what number of votes are provided if we're using asymmetric voting, uh, and what permissions they have. Are they allowed to perform you know, a chain code upgrade? Are they allowed to do any, any other sort of operations? That would all be listed as a set of permissions that, that each organization is allowed. Um, and then and also as part of the initial proposal, the proposing organization would need to provide its MSP info so the other organizations can then join the ops channel. So a little bit also as well right, about about voting. So you know, voting is basically an issue about how is it, how is agreement achieved. So right now in Fabric, uh, Fabric uses signature policies for uh, uh, approving or endorsing or, or allowing the submission of transaction and committee to those transactions, as well as for things like channel config updates. So the config TX transactions. Um, and a signature policy is is nothing more than an expression of one or more principles. So if you're not familiar with this, this is basically it says that um, I can have a, an, an MSP and a role, so like here, uh, org one admin, um, and then I can specify a set of, of uh, logical operations that that uh, that can be used to specify what what meets the the, the policy. So as an example here, I have an and. So it says this is an and of org one member and org two member. So that means that if that's the policy, then both uh, a member of org one and a member of org two would need to sign the, the proposal. Um, there's a, here's a more complicated one where we have and of either org one or org two uh, signing as well as org three admin signing. Um, so these are different ways in which the policies are currently defined right now within, within Fabric. Uh, but they have a number of limitations, and we'd like to try to enhance the, the voting capability or the agreement capabilities within Fabric to support some of what's proposed here for the operation system chain code. Um, so what is missing? So in, in the operation system chain code itself related to voting, uh, there's no ability to abstain. There, there's no ability to veto. Um, and and you know, abstention is, is valuable in terms of being able to know whether an organization has voted or not. So it would be valuable to have recorded as part of the, the voting operations that some organization abstained, uh, just to know that they have voted that they, and they don't really have an issue with whatever the decision is. Um, you still need to support whatever the, the, the in policy is, but uh, they're just indicating that this is something that uh, was not of interest to them or they want to let people know that they're not going to vote for or against it. Um, the current thing only supports a single vote per organization, basically a signature. Um, and there's, as I say, there's no veto capability. So in some forms of consortiums, there are certain members that would have veto capabilities. I mean, if you look at something like, you know, the United Nations, not necessarily that's a consortia, but certain organizations or members have veto capabilities and others do not. 
Um, in fabric, then there's also then we need we would need additional changes then to be able to support um, additional voting policies here. So right now, the only thing that's supported in fabric is a, what we would call a four vote. So basically, if you sign the proposal, you're agreeing to it. If you don't sign the proposal, we don't know whether you're agreeing, disagreeing, or just didn't bother. Um, so this would require some changes in fabric then to be able to support these kind of voting enhancements. So what we'd like to propose in in Fabric is that um, we and, and it, actually in the operation system chain code is the ability to support these consortiums, the formation of them, and the administration of them. So that would in, 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 uh, entail creating another uh, chain code to support consortium, just like there's a chain code for channel operations and a chain code and a uh, chain code for chain code operations. We'd have another one for formation and administration of consortia. Um, we need to add some voting enhancements to the current Ops SC voting mechanism. Um, and we would also then need to add some additional support policies, endorsement policies, and the like to Fabric to support this enhanced voting. Uh, so there are changes that would be required both in Ops SC as well as in Fabric. Um, and then ideally, it would be helpful to take something like the Ops SC agent right now uh, and uh, integrate that with a deployment tool, such as something like Hyperledger Cello. Um, that can be used to then create the initial deployment. Because right now, to create this uh, a network, it's largely up to each individual member to take care of all the all the manual steps that have to be taken. With something like integrations with the Ops System Chain Code and Cello, we can potentially automate a lot of that initial deployment. So, in, in summary, uh, I say we think, and, and our experience has been that consortium formation is difficult. Uh, and often has been, you know, led by a single organization, so it's not particularly decentralized. We'd like the formation and management of the consortium to be much more decentralized uh, and and much more automated, because right now, largely, as I say, it's a manual set of steps. Uh, we want to uh, leverage the existing operation system chain code as it provides, you know, much of what we needed, uh, and it fits a model that we believe makes sense for consortium management. Uh, provides, you know, say the mechanisms to be able to automate stuff, to be able to come to agreement on decisions that affect the network, uh, and that's all that's all in place right now. What's missing is sort of the consortium side of that, and especially the consortium forming portion of that. Um, and the, the, you know, the ult ultimate goal here is to simplify uh, and automate the the uh, formation of a consortium based upon Hyperledger Fabric. Um, uh, to, to join in, if you'd like to comment, like to help, do whatever you'd like, uh, there's a, uh, a Rocket Chat channel for the Operation System Chain Code. Uh, the link is provided there on the slide. Uh, and as well, the source code for that project is located uh, at, uh, in GitHub as a Hyperledger Labs project. And with that, I'm going to open it up for any Q&A. Any thoughts, any questions, any interest in contributing or, you know, help, helping with this? So the question was, Mahesh asked, uh, is Oracle going to provide any of these features as part of the Oracle blockchain as a service, our Oracle blockchain platform? Um, I, I have to be careful here. I don't, I don't have a safer harbor statement here. Um, all I can say is that we are proposing this. This is in line with, with our thinking about how consortiums should be formed and managed. Uh, I obviously, I can't make any commitment to say that we're going to provide this. <clears throat> What kind of, uh, Peter asked, what kind of storage would the initial out of bounds, out of band, I'm assuming you mean bootstrap uh, could use? So the, the, this is the idea that the out of band mechanism is, is what we're proposing to, uh, using these, these temporary credentials where the proposing organization would grant temporary access, limited access to its API server 
so that those organizations could then uh, provide the information that's necessary to bootstrap the organization. So that would all be stored on chain. Uh, and initially, it would only be in, in the proposer's network, but as that network then is expanded and other, other members join the network, agree to, to be a participant, then they, they would automatically get a copy of that ledger as well. Um, so there's no really, the intent here is there's little to no out of band storage, that, uh, that all the storage would be maintained in the, the chain code operations. <clears throat> And Mark, Mark Markovich asked, uh, how would handling dropping members out of the consortium if they leave? Uh, I, I, again, this would be based upon the, the, the voting policies that are for the consortium membership itself. Um, so this would be something where members might have to be careful uh, that you don't get yourself, uh, you know, hit. You know, the, the issue right now is like in Fabric, if you have an endorsement policy, it says that every organization must endorse a transaction to be accepted. Um, and one of those organizations drops out, uh, you're, you can't get a valid set of signatures to be able to perform a config transaction to alter the, the, the channel membership. So you have to be very careful about this, that, such that you don't end up in a situation where you can't, uh, you can't actually meet the endorsement policy or the signature policy required. Um, Hesh asks, besides the REST API for agents, is there a front end for the agents being open sourced? Um, at, at the moment, there's, that's not part of the Ops SC ch system chain code uh, project, but I could envision that being something. The issue there is that, that that probably needs to integrate in with whatever sort of you know, front end the platform that you're using uh, requires. So in the case of Oracle blockchain platform, if we pick this up and integrate this in with ours, this would be something that would all be handled through our, our console. And so I would imagine other, other fabric implementations would have similar uh, sorts of capabilities or some sort of management console. And again, that's where this stuff would, would, would lie. Any other questions? All right, if not, I thank you, and I'll give you back another two and a half minutes of your day. Uh, and I hope you found this uh, a valuable session. And please, if you have interest in this, we're you know it would be great to have additional contributors supporting this. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the the information in the Rocket Chat and and GitHub is there in the slides. So. Uh, if you want to go back to that later, they should be able to find that without problems. And with that, uh, see no more additional questions, then I will close the session then. Thank you all.